talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing around surgical coaching um, as an approach to, to performance improvement. Um, I do have a couple of disclosures. We do have some funding from Covidian and Medtronic for our coaching work, but most of it is from federal funding. And then I also serve as a consultant to Johnson & Johnson's Human Performance Institute. So today my goal is to, to try to identify the gap and explain why I think that this is a really important area for us to think about as surgeons. Talk through the definition, theory, and principles of coaching and what distinguishes it from some of the other approaches that we take to education and performance development. Talk about how we're operationalizing surgical coaching, and then finally finish up with an overview of the state of the science as well as some of the preliminary data from the work that we're doing. So let's start with the gap. So we're all very familiar with our current approach to continuing medical education. It's really based on a summative evaluation where we complete residency and fellowship, we take a board exam, once we're done we participate in some CME activities which are primarily teacher driven didactic and amassed and what that means is, is that I decide what's important, I make some PowerPoint slides and I stand up here and I feed that to you and somehow magically you take what you learn in an environment like this and you take that back and you change your practice. And we all know that that's really hard to do. And so the goal with this approach to CME is really competency. Recently people have started talking much more about continuous professional development, which tries to integrate some of the theories about how adults learn that are very well developed in the education world. And this is really focusing on a formative evaluation rather than a summative evaluation. It's about lifelong learning where it's student driven, interactive, and distributed. And I'm going to talk a lot more about that during the course of my talk, but basically what it means is that it's individualized to where you are and where your gaps are that need to be addressed. It's based on teaching people about self-assessment, practice modification and improvement, and here the goal is really about improving performance regardless of what level you're at. So many of you are familiar with maintenance of certification. I just had to recertify this year and it was extremely painful. Um, and I think that really the underlying theories are very sound, right? It's really hard to argue with the principles that you should have good professional standing, you should be devoted to lifelong learning and self-assessment, you should have cognitive expertise, and you should be able to evaluate your performance in practice. Those are really good, sound principles. The problem is, is that we haven't yet developed the tools to meet this in a meaningful way. And I think we've seen that in the news as we've seen that some of the other specialty boards start to revolt against the way that MOC is structured. And so there's lots of ongoing um, conversations at the American Board of Medical Specialties and the American Board of Surgery about how we develop <laughs> programs and tools to meet these unmet needs. Another thing that's important to talk to you about in, uh, as we talk about the background and the gap here is this very important paper that was published out of Michigan in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. This comes from their bariatric collaborative and what they did was they asked the surgeons in the collaborative to send in their typical case, so everyone sent in their best case, and then they sent it out to all the other surgeons in the collaborative and asked them to rate the surgeon's video on a scale of one to five, it's a Likert scale, it's based on OSATs for those of you who are familiar with it. And what they found is that there was wide variation in the way that surgeons were scored by their peers. And so you see people down here around two and a half and all the way up to five. And this was really enlightening for a number of reasons. I mean, I think we all expect this, right? We all know that there's variation in the way that we perform in the OR. But one of the really interesting things was that one of the surgeons in the collaborative says, I thought I was really slick until I saw that guy's video. Right? We, we operate in a bubble. We don't necessarily know what other people do or what other people look like or really what we look like on video. But perhaps the more important finding in this study was that because the collaborative collects risk adjusted outcomes, they were able to correlate that performance with a number of different outcomes and this is just one example. But this on the x axis you see that surgical skill rating I just showed you from 2 to 5. And on the y-axis, you see the risk-adjusted complication rates for those surgeons. And here you could see all the way from 20% for people with the lower skill rating down to 5%. So we're talking a fourfold difference in complication rates based solely on the way that the surgeon operates in the operating room and what other surgeons see them doing based on their video review. Now the other thing that was fascinating about this was that they tried to correlate this with things like years out of practice or years out of training or in practice, 
the, whether they were in an academic or a community institution, whether they had done an MIS fellowship, and none of those things correlated with where the surgeons were on this curve. And that was very similar to some results that we had found in Boston where we looked at when adverse events happen and there's harm to patients in the OR, what are the, what are the conditions under which those things are occurring? And surprisingly, they're mostly under routine operations as opposed to index operations. So we all think whipples and um, esophagectomies, but actually it's the lap coles and the hernias where these things are happening. Most often in blue in each of these bars you could see about three quarters of the time it's an experienced attending operating within their specialty doing what they do every day. And so the question is then, well, what's happening here? And what we find is that actually most often it's because there's some complicating circumstance in which the surgeon is operating. So 60% of the time there's a patient complexity, right? The BMI is 50, it's a redo, redo, there's some reason that it's more complicated. Or there's a system or organizational failure that they don't deal with as appropriately as they could. And so if we think about our current approaches to improving performance, what we've mostly focused on from a policy standpoint have been focused on this idea of getting people to the high volume surgeons, right? So regionalization, selective referral, or increasing <coughs> our specialization. We're all narrowing the scope of our practice. We're doing fellowships after residency. And really none of these things are gonna get to the heart of the problem, which is helping people to figure out what to do when unexpected things occur in the operating room and to continue to improve their performance throughout their career. And so this led us to the concept of surgical coaching. We looked at other disciplines and said, okay, well how do people do this in other areas, in athletics, in education, in music? Really they do this almost throughout um, a, a number of other disciplines. And so many of you may have read the um, New Yorker article that Atul published. And um, in fact, the first paper that I published was with Atul when I was um, at the Brigham. And we um, did some video review, and this is basically a proof of concept study where we just had four surgeons review their videos and everybody thought it was fantastic. So we had people from their first year in practice all the way up to the most senior people in the institution do it. And across the board, they thought that it was really, really very helpful. Okay, so the pushback I get on this is we coach, we've been doing this forever, this is just a fancy new name for the same thing that we've been doing. And really it's not, and it's really about changing our mindset. So I'm gonna talk to you about why I think that this is different than our current approaches. So let's start with a definition. Um, there's a number of different definitions out there. Um, these are two that I think really capture the essence of what it is that we're trying to do. It's about unlocking a person's potential to maximize their own performance and helping them learn rather than teaching them. It's about providing objective and constructive feedback to help someone recognize what works and what can be improved and inspire them to maximize their potential. Now the thing that you'll notice about these definitions is that they're really focused on the coachee, right? The coach is really an instrument who's there to help facilitate the coachee in their learning. They're not teaching them something, they're trying to bring out and teach that person to assess themselves and to question what it is that they do and how they can do it better. So there's three core characteristics that I think are also very important. The first is the power balance. So by nature, coaching should be a collaborative relationship where neither participant takes a superior role. Again, so this is very different than training our trainees, right? It should be about self-directed activities, so it should enhance the intrinsic motivation of surgeons um, and enable them to follow their self-concordant goals. Again, individualized goals, individual gaps in practice, individualized areas that we want to work on as surgeons. And it should develop capacity. Ideally, you should monitor the progress of the coachee until they start to develop their own habits of self monitoring. And so the idea of coaching is as you work with a coachee, you give them selectively less and less feedback as you go along to the point where the person is actually able to continue the self-assessment on their own. There's a specific type of coaching called peer coaching, which is the principle that we primarily follow. We do have some programs that are expert coaching, but in general, what we're promoting is peer coaching. And this is a distinctive type of coaching in which peers who should be at about the same level of knowledge, engage in an equal non-competitive relationship that involves the establishment of goals, observation of a task, self-evaluation and coach feedback to improve task performance and support the implementation of changes. Now we, we just had our coaching session, uh, coaching session in Michigan last week and at the end, several of the, the coaches said, this really felt equal. It felt like I was learning as much as, as he was and I was like, 
that's it. That's the point. That's what we're trying to get to. And I think, you know, there's been pushback about the term coaching, but I really think it's important that we have it focus on one person's practice at a time as opposed to both to make sure that it's focused on the specific needs of that one person. And there's been a review actually that was done of looking at peer coaching specifically in healthcare and that suggested it's really promising for, for professional development and training. So let's talk for a minute about adult experiential learning. So we know, sort of the collective we, that adults learn best when they're active participants in their learning. So it should be about, again, self-directed learning, facilitated self-reflection, and allowing an individual to identify and pursue their own goals. And the content has to be relevant. I think that was what frustrated me so much about you know, studying for my recertification exam, is that I'm a breast surgeon. I don't do trauma, I don't do vascular. You know, and so spending time thinking about those things that I'm really never going to do was really a little bit frustrating when what I really wanted to do was to be able to read the most recent studies and be able to make sure that I was up to date on everything in my field and to learn about how I could improve what I was doing as an individual. And then finally, it's based on this concept of constructive feedback. And I think constructive feedback is a term that we hear a lot and we throw around a lot, but I'm not sure that we all give constructive feedback as surgeons. Because constructive feedback is descriptive, specific, and non-judgmental. So it's not just saying, uh-huh, or nice job. It's saying exactly what it is that's nice, exactly what it is that they're doing appropriately, so that they can then imprint that, or being very descriptive about what they could be doing better. So it's focused on observations of behaviors and the impact of those behaviors rather than on assumptions or inferences. And it's followed by an opportunity for the person that you're giving feedback to to consider and respond. So you cannot agree with the constructive feedback that you give and you can challenge the coach or the person giving you the feedback with why you think that your approach is better. And ultimately, you know, good feedback and, a good, and, and good questions, and we'll talk a little bit more about questioning, really should lead to a discussion and a back and forth between a coach and a coachee. So there's a concept called deliberate practice that many of you may have heard of, and this comes from somebody named Hans Erickson. And he says that it's critical for the development or attainment of expertise. And there's four things that sustained deliberate practice requires. It requires individual reflection on one's own practice, the identification of areas for improvement, specific intentional adjustments to your practice, and an evaluation of the impact of those adjustments. And without ongoing formative assessment such as this, then progress will stall in a state of proficiency. And so he actually writes about this in healthcare and says that clinical practice is not deliberate practice. While we do some of this stuff on the fly, very rarely do we really step back and take a look at our practice and ask if we're doing things in the best possible way. And so this is a, a figure from Erickson which shows that if you think about everyday skills, so here we have like walking and talking, right? Over time they become autonomous. We don't think about these things anymore. We sort of do them in an automated way. And the same thing can happen with higher level skills where you can, again, stop really thinking about things and you do them rotely, right? So it's 20 years into practice, it's really hard to continue to challenge yourself to ask, am I doing this the best way that I can? And so the idea of coaching really is to try to prevent people from, from ending up in this area of arrested development and move them up to expert performance. The other place that you may have seen this was in Daniel Pink's book, Drive, where he talks about the asymptotic curve of mastery. And it's this idea that no matter how good you get or how much experience you get, you should always be in pursuit of perfection and there's always room to improve. Now it's incrementally obviously going to get smaller, but you're never going to achieve perfection. It's the same way, reason that professional athletes and professional musicians continue to have coaches to challenge them and continue to try to, to tweak different aspects of their performance throughout their entire career. I also really like this quote, which um, was actually from a book called The Fifth Discipline, The Art and Practice of the Learning Organization, which talks about mastery. It says, people with a high level of personal mastery live in a state of continual learning. They never arrive. Personal mastery is not something you possess, it's a process and a lifelong discipline. Now that's very different than the way that we think of a master surgeon, right? We think of a master surgeon as sort of the person who has arrived, the person who everybody calls in the OR when they get into trouble. And so many of the concepts around continual evaluation, continual performance that you need for coaching 
I think are actually in direct conflict in some ways with the traditional surgical mindset. And I'm going to talk you through two of these and why I think we need to think about finding ways that we can transition out of our traditional mindset in order to undergo um, this type of activity. So let's talk first about expert versus learner. So we're all experts, right? I mean, when you're an attending surgeon, you take a patient to the operating room, you have to view yourself as an expert, patients have to view you as an expert, the people in the room do, right? And so to be an expert, you have to know all the answers. And because you know all the answers, you show little curiosity. You rely in general on habits, routines, and rules. And you feel competent, complete, and comfortable. And we should feel that way in the operating room, right? But the problem is, is that right now we don't really have any space in which we can transition into being a learner, where we wonder about answers, we show great openness, we challenge assumptions and beliefs, and we continuously test our competence, accept discomfort, and tolerate conflict. And so the idea of coaching is to really provide a safe environment where we can support each other to spend more time in this learner mode. The other um, mindset that I wanted to, to bring to your attention is this concept about learner responsibility. And again, this gets at why peer coaching is so different than training of residents and fellows. So when you train residents and fellows and medical students, in general, you're in the rescue mode, right? You, you, um, you go in thinking that the person you're operating with can't do this without you. You fear they're not capable. And in the end, you're going to take the blame if anything goes wrong. The problem is, is that what this does is it's very weakness focused. You make decisions and give directions, and so it's results oriented, and it fosters dependence. And I think that this is part of the problem right now is that we're not really transitioning trainees to independence anymore because of some of the rules and regulations that have limited us, and we haven't yet quite figured out how to make those transitions. Now on the other hand, when we talk about peer coaching, it's really very responsibility focused. So the other person has the wisdom and ability and it's your job to bring it out. The other person has a choice about how to react and respond. And because it's the other person's practice, they have to live with the results of what you do. So if you change something in their practice that isn't gonna work for them and it changes the way that they're able to function in their environment, that's not a very good thing, right? That's not what we're going for. And so because the other person has responsibility and you're helping to try to develop them, it's really strength-based. It stimulates thinking with great questions, it's learning-oriented, and it really builds capacity on the part of the person that you're working with. So let's talk about how we operationalize this for surgeons. So one of the things, I started doing this coaching work right as I was transitioning from Boston to Wisconsin, and I was really fortunate when I got to Wisconsin because we had some fantastic coaches there. So I was able to go and spend some time with the Badgers coaches. At the time, it was Brett Bielema, um, and then Bo Ryan, who's been the um, Big Ten Coach of the Year a number of times and really is a fantastic coach. Um, but I also went over to the School of Music and spent time with, with um, coaches who, who coach musicians, as well as in education. And in fact, we ended up recruiting um, one of the professors from the School of Education who has developed the coaching programs for teachers in schools to be part of our team. So we developed this framework which was published in Annals of Surgery, and actually this is sort of the Wisconsin Framework 2.0 because we've updated it based on our experience. But the idea is we wanted to come up with a, a, a summary of the things that surgeons need to think about if they were to develop a coaching program. And so you need to think about the context in which you develop the program, right? So are you going to do video versus live coaching, peer versus expert? What level are you going to do it at? The institution, the region, nationally? Um, over here in TAN are the things that you need to control for, right? So you want everybody to be able to participate. So based on the surgeon's experience, their skill level, their interpersonal skills, all of those things, you need your coaches to be able to adapt based on what the coachee brings to the table. Similarly, based on their clinical scenario and the characteristics of the system in which they work. The areas in blue are things that you can actually select for, right? So you can decide how to select your coaches to make sure that they have the right knowledge and experience and that they have the right interpersonal skills. And then these are the things that you actually work on during the coaching session. So what kinds of things do we focus on um, in these coaching programs? And it depends a lot on the goals of the program. So some of the programs that I have focus specifically on technical skills, and we'll talk about those a little bit. 
Um, and the one that, um, the original one in Wisconsin, we, we said that surgeons could focus on any aspect of their performance. And this is a really um, well-established model to sort of break down surgical performance into more manageable buckets. So there's technical skills, there's cognitive skills, and then interpersonal skills. And so surprisingly, about 50% of our surgeons, or maybe not surprisingly, want to work on their interpersonal skills. So they want to work on, for older surgeons, how do they adapt to the changing culture in the OR, right? This is, a, this is a big issue. Or for new surgeons, how do they adapt to changing to the other side of the table and actually being the one that's, that's calling the shots? The other, the reason that there's these big blue arrows though and the thing that's been really fascinating for me in this work is how interrelated all of these are. So in all of the conversations that we have, the surgeons will start focusing on one of these components, yet they'll often, the, the conversation very quickly and the questioning very quickly moves into some of the other ones, right? Because you have to be able to communicate appropriately with your assistant in order to change your exposure. And so they're all very interrelated. One of the things that we didn't think about but actually came out during our coaching sessions, we had several people who were very interested in stress management and how do they recognize when they're starting to get stressed in the operating room and then how, what kinds of coping strategies can they come up with to help to control some of the changes that might happen as one of your cases starts to go um, a little bit in the wrong direction. So the activities of coaching, so this was sort of that bottom white thing, what is it that we're trying to teach coaches to do? It's really based on, on three concepts. So the concept of active listening, so it's critical to develop trust, rapport, and um, develop powerful questions. You have to hear what people are saying to you. And one of the things that um, one of the executive coach that's on our team told me, which I found very fascinating, she said, think about how much time you spend actually listening to the person you're talking to and how much time you spend waiting for your turn to talk. So very often we're already thinking about what it is that we're gonna say to contribute to the conversation rather than actually absorbing what it is the person in front of us is, is saying to us. And that's a cultural thing here in America. So powerful inquiry, we try to teach people to use open-ended questions to challenge in a non-competitive, non-threatening manner. And then constructive feedback, which we've already talked about. So in talking to other disciplines, we found that there was really consistency around what makes an effective coach. They need to have good communication skills. They need to be adaptable. They have to be able to assess and understand different coaches' needs and perspectives. They have to be able to motivate, have a broad knowledge base, and be respected in the field. So these are just two quotes from other disciplines from athletics. Successful coaches are masterful communicators and unsuccessful coaches often fail, not because they lack knowledge of the sport, but because of poor communication skills. And then from music, so the ability to adapt, like I say, situational is 95% of being a good coach. Reading the situation and figuring out what each person needs. So another decision is video versus real time. So we decided to go with video for a number of reasons. And um, when I show you the results, you'll see that this didn't work out as well as we'd like it to. Um, but there's a number of reasons that video is very good. Um, probably the biggest one is that it really allows you to see yourself operating. And I think that in and of itself can be really informative for people. It's been shown to be more successful in sustaining behavior change. It confers a time savings of 50 to 80%. So again, going and, and scrubbing or watching someone perform a Whipple in the operating room takes much longer than sitting down with a videotape where you can fast forward to the salient points and watch it in an hour. So we limited all of our coaching sessions to an hour, just understanding the issues with surgeons' um, schedules. It removes concurrent responsibilities on the part of the person being coached so that they can allow full concentration on their performance assessment. No matter how much you're trying to focus on getting feedback and thinking about your performance and what it is you're doing, at the end of the day there's a patient on the table and you're going to be focused on that patient and not necessarily on your performance. So by using video you can watch it in a, in a, in a remote setting. And then finally it mitigates some of the medical legal um, and credentialing complexities. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking to, to lawyers about this and really everyone feels that this is um, peer review, just like M&M, and that it should be protected from discoverability. So video capture in the OR, um, we've come a long, long way. We have a long, long way to go. Um, many ORs are equipped with multiple angles and different cameras, and um, one of the institutions in our study had that, and, and their video footage was, was really fantastic. 
For others, for people that are in small community hospitals, we would send them out um, video glasses. We made um, boxes with these GoPro cameras as well as omnidirectional microphones to try to allow them to capture the room. And it worked to some degree, but it, you know, it's not perfect. Um, you know, we're getting there. And then timing. So this was a big question for us. So when do you watch it? Do you walk out of the room and go and watch your video? Um, and we really thought that this quote from music was really telling. If you watch your video the next day, it's very different than if you watch it right after. Because if you watch it right after, you remember exactly what you were doing and you are making a direct map, so you miss a lot. Wait a week. So we, in general, try to get our surgeons to watch their video about two weeks after the case, thinking that they will have an, that it's close enough that they can remember the specifics of the case, but it's far enough away that they can be a bit more objective. And there's actually data to support this. Um, in general, task-specific feedback should be immediate, but more complicated feedback is better delayed. So again, if you want to change the way that somebody throws a suture in a specific setting, you need to tell them right away how you want them to change their position. But if you want them to change sort of their entire approach to an operation, use a different incision, consider a different exposure, that's much better taken out of that situation and discussed at a later time. Okay, so the state of the science. Is surgical coaching effective? So we're still gathering data. Like any research, it takes time to gather data. But there's reason to believe that this will be very effective. So these are two studies that were done in education, um, actually in the 1980s, where teachers either participated in traditional professional development activities, so workshops, that kind of thing, um, or they were, peer, they, were, they were partnered with a peer coach to help them then adapt that back into their practice. And the effect size here are really amazing, right? They went from 20% practice change up to 95%, and in this study from 15 to 75%. I mean, those are huge effects. If we could even get a third of that, right? I mean, that would be amazing. Um, in internal executive coaching, they looked at productivity. Again, people who participated just in a training program, or they worked in a, uh, participated in a training program and then were, um, again, paired with a peer coach. And you see a similar effect size. And these are really this four-fold effect size that's pretty consistent across the literature on coaching. There's recently been a couple of studies that have come out in surgery. These are randomized controlled trials that look at trainees. So the first one looks at students. This is a randomized controlled trial looking at uh, the role of video-based coaching for novices. So these are students who have not seen laparoscopy before um, on, a, on a laparoscopic trainer. And so uh, one group was randomized to just basically working on the trainer and the, um, the usual care. And the other one, uh, received video-based expert coaching. And you can see that there was a marked improvement um, in the performance of the people who received the coaching, whereas those who did not remain very relatively stable, despite starting at the same level. We see similar results for uh, trainees. So these are residents who were on a bariatric surgery rotation in Canada. And again, they were randomized to either get um, coaching by one of the attendings or to standard of care. They were evaluated on OSAT, which is that same um, instrument that the bariatric surgeons use. This one, again, specifically developed for residents. Both SATs, which is a bariatric specific version. And then they looked at technical error. And so you can see here that the control, that the, there was no difference between the control group and the coaching group when they started. And there was no difference between the control group when they started the rotation and when they finished the rotation. But there was a significant improvement for the coaching arm along all of these different domains. And again, there was a sort of a second piece of this, which I found even more fascinating, which was they asked the trainees to score themselves, and then they were scored by experts. And they compared the two. And at baseline, there was no correlation, really, between the way that the, uh, sur that the trainees um, scored themselves and the way that the experts scored them. But when you look at the coaching arm, and both of them had the same um, baseline, again, it was a, right around 0.4 you see that there's actually a very strong correlation. A correlation coefficient of 0 0.8 is actually really impressive. And so what this shows is that the trainees actually are learning this ability to do self-assessment and to be more accurate in understanding where their limitations are and where their strengths are. So it's showing that formative evaluation actually does work in teaching this new skill. So what about surgeons in practice? 
So this is where we do all of our work, is in trying to get peer coaching for surgeons in practice. And this was you know, a somewhat discouraging article that was published in Annals of Surgery out of, out of Canada, where they asked attending surgeons what they saw as the barriers to surgical coaching. And you know, surgeons in practice, the ones they talked to, weren't too excited about the idea. And they had concerns about um, the value of technical skill. So surgeons in academic practice really felt that they already had sufficient technical skill. And because they were academic surgeons, they would rather focus on other parts of their career um, for self-improvement, given the limited time and energy that they had to devote to that. They had concerns about image and authority. So again, sort of this idea of being the expert and being competent, how you know, critical that is in our, in our um, discipline and how participating in something like this could make them look less than. Um, and then the loss of autonomy because surgeons wanted to maintain control over their learning agenda. Now, uh, Mary Klingen Smith, who is the vice chair of the American Board of Surgery, and I wrote an editorial about this saying that actually all three of these concerns just show a misunderstanding of what coaching is. And you can see in this column here how coaching actually applies to all of these settings, right? So the whole idea of coaching is that it's individualized and that you set your own learning agenda. I would argue that very few of us, when it comes to CME right now, control our learning agenda. So I think the third one is pretty easy to deal with. In terms of the value of technical skill, again, it's designed to work on whatever aspect of your performance you want to work on. And in fact, in the Wisconsin coaching program, we had people where the it was designed to be video-based in the OR. We had coaches who went and observed their coachee in a teaching conference because they wanted to improve their teaching, right? When you work with a coach, you can design what it is that you want their feedback on and you want to improve. And then finally, this appearance of competence and expertise. This is why one of the major reasons that we chose the video review, so that it's two surgeons in a room, confidential, nobody else is there, you have a video, you're talking to somebody else who gets it, right? And you're not trying to do this in front of the nurses and the medical students and kind of everybody else. So there was um, a paper that was published out of um, pediatrics that talked about regional estate organizations. Now, I'm not sure what ha what's happening here in Alabama, but you know, in Wisconsin, I think the Wisconsin Surgical Society, which is also our state chapter, is struggling a little bit with its identity. Originally, it was developed to really help to improve the quality of surgical care in the state. And over time, it's kind of morphed into the four major <laughs> academic institutions having their residents present their science, which isn't really relevant for the surgeons in practice. And so we're very interested in trying to get back to our roots and think about how we can use the state society to really improve quality. And the other thing that has come up, in a, and that we'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute, are these regional collaboratives. And I think those are sort of personified in Michigan, where surgeons are coming together regionally to try to work together to improve um, performance. And in this pediatric paper, they talk about why this is the right level to be doing this at. Um, the first is that there's trust, familiarity, and participation already on the part of surgeons, so it increases their acceptance and participation in these types of programs. You can engage physicians across practice settings. It's a small enough community to afford some familiarity with and respect for the coaches, and um, I already mentioned this regional collaboratives. So let's talk about the Wisconsin Surgical Coaching Program. So this was a QI initiative that we started through our state chapter. In trying to figure out how to identify coaches, we actually decided to do peer nomination, which worked incredibly well. So we gave them that list of what makes an effective coach, and we sent it out to the, to the membership, and we said, please nominate your peers that you would want to coach you based on this experience. The other thing that we found at the Brigham was that our coach was very good at coaching. He was very adaptable. He was very, as he said, that he had a light hand when it came to his feedback. And he said it came from his decades of intraoperative consults. And so we actually said, think of people that get called a lot for intraoperative consults or get curbsided, because those are the people that probably have the right ability to give feedback that make people comfortable. So once we identified our coaches, we put them through a four-hour training program. We gave them a resource manual. We um, aimed to recruit 10 surgeons to participate, had them video record an operation based on their individual goals, and then had them have a one-hour coaching session with, in 14 to 30 days. And the goal here was to repeat this quarterly over the course of a year. So this is what our training manual looks like. Um, I'm now going to show you a couple of videos. Um, these are very short videos, but I think they illustrate really um, <coughs> what um, coaching for surgeons in practice actually looks like. 
So you got through that initial difficult portion and you were talking about uh, another area that you kind of struggled in terms of progressing. You want to fast forward to yeah, what you're talking about I there? Mean, so here the, the residents are all pretty good at isolating mm -hmm. the cord structures and so there's, there's not much to see here. So if we fast forward to really I think the next part that I tend to struggle with is the actual mesh placement itself. And so um, yeah, I've never never really loved the wheat lanterns. I um, I think they tend to just be more in the way and, and the ones that we had where I trained never really held all that well and so I, I've never been a big fan of using them but so at the same time then I usually end up sacrificing one hand to try and hold things open while I'm trying to follow with the, their suture on the mesh and then trying to hold the mesh in place and so I've and all these different things I'm trying to do and I just feel like I end up with a finger in the surgical field holding the mesh down and another hand doing something that's probably not ideal. Sure. And there's a bit of stuff in there too. Yeah. You got your pen rows, you got a clamp, it looks like on the external oblique yep. on top and bottom. Looks like the medical student's trying to help you in there a little bit. Um, uh, did, I suspect that the people you trained with weren't terribly fond of the wheat liner as well? Or? They, they use it, I think they just use it a lot better than I do. Okay. Um, I, I just never, I always found that it was kind of in the way. I certainly would suggest that might be a simple way to uh, get rid of some of the stuff that's in your way there and, and really clear off, uh, for instance, the shelving edge mm -hmm. um, so that you can see for getting, getting your finger out of there and getting a little bit safer. Mm -hmm. Right about there, you can yeah. see your. I can see what you mean, where the the needle is going very close to your finger. Yeah, it's there. it's pretty close, and um, and then you know at the same time, just kind of things are flopping around and just not not set up well mm -hmm. to make things move smoothly. It, it always ends up looking pretty good in the end, but I think it could certainly be a little bit better. Yeah, this is a fairly big guy too. It looks like uh, mm -hmm. I would bet that the the wheat lander might give you some assistance there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The coach e is doing a lot of the talking, right? He's thinking about his practice. He's talking through where it is that he's struggling. And just as a little bit of, of background, this is a very busy MIS surgeon who does about you know, 250 hernias a year. 99% of them are done laparoscopically. When he does them open, it's you know, those complicated cases we talked about where things are more likely to go wrong. It's a redo, redo. You know, there's some reason that he's doing it open. And so the case he chose to focus on was open hernia repair. The next thing I wanted to show you, oops, sorry about that, is um, the interpersonal skills piece. So far, most of our discussion is focused on the technical aspects and the kind of cognitive approach to these mm -hmm. cases. Um, let's talk a little bit about your interpersonal skills and how they relate in the operating room. How do you feel like you get along with folks? I, so I, I think I'm a pretty easygoing guy and tend to get along with, with most people in the OR. So you walk into the OR, tell me what kind of things you do. Um, so usually I just go and help the nurses and start prepping the patient. Okay. They appreciate that, I assume. I, I think so. I yeah. hope so. So maybe we can start by looking at the beginning of your case yeah, when, sure. when you first walk into the room. Stop it there for a second. Your thoughts. Uh, it, it, it does look like kind of everyone else in the room maybe tensed up a little bit, um, which I don't think I've ever really noticed before. And do you think it's something from the past, or is it something uh, going on that day? No, I mean, I think, you know, when, when getting to the OR and usually cases start late, I maybe get a little frustrated and just try and move things along to try and get back on time and and maybe that's, that's kind of a weird environment for everyone. Okay, and I think that's an important thing to look at too because you know, clearly the, the team is there to work with you mm -hmm. and maybe there's some things we can identify that would uh, put that in a better position to begin yeah. with. That'd be good. So you can see, right, the value of just taking a step back and looking at what's happening in the operating room. I just want to finish by talking about the, cure, the, the peer coaching that we're doing in, um, bariat in the Bariatric Surgery Collaborative in Michigan. So this is funded by an R01 from NIDDK um, that Justin Dimmick and I are, are co-PIs of. And the aim of this really was to adapt our program to Michigan and then to evaluate the impact on the peer ratings of surgical scale, so that OSAT scale that I showed you at the beginning, as well as to evaluate the impact on risk-adjusted complications. And so who are the coaches? So the surgeons in the bariatric collaborative said, I don't want anybody coaching me who's below me on this scale. And so we took that, that, those top performers, the top quartile, and trained them to be coaches. 
but everyone is participating. So even the coaches are acting as coaches. So there is nothing, again, there's nothing about this that says that you're not performing well. This is about improving for everybody. And in fact, I will tell you that the coaches in this are our most enthusiastic coaches because they went through the training and they really see the value. Um, I'm going to skip over Project Adopt, but um, this is an expert coaching program that we've developed that has sort of three parts where surgeons who want to learn how to do laparoscopic inguinal hernias and already do other laparoscopic um, procedures and do open hernias can come. We have a day-long didactic session. There's then some proctoring. They, they scrub with an expert, and then they transition into a 10-case um, coaching program. And again, the, the uh, reviews from the participants of this have really been outstanding. These are people who have taken the weekend courses and really just not been able to make that transition back into practice. And they really feel like having a coach there that they can call and that can review their videos for their first 10 cases made all the difference. So just to summarize, you know, I think we have more questions than answers at this point, right? Um, this is a huge ongoing research program. More and more people are getting into this field and trying to answer some of these questions. You know, are we going to be able to improve patient outcomes? Can it lead to sustainable practice change? How would this be financed? You know, I think the most important question, though, is are we ready as a discipline for the required cultural change? I think we're on the right track, though. You know, we have this increased national focus on quality, safety, and transparency. We're getting better and better with the AV technical capacities. Coaching has a lot of face validity. You know, as I talk about this to people, they're like, this just makes sense, right? Why aren't we doing this already? These are surgeon-led initiatives. They're constructive and not punitive. And the first randomized controlled trials that have been done in other disciplines and with residents and students suggest that this is really going to be effective. So in summary, I think coaching has the potential to improve performance throughout surgical careers. It incorporates concepts of adult learning theory. It has the potential to address variation in performance and to ultimately improve quality, safety, and outcomes for our patients. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the huge number of people that um, participate in the studies that I discussed, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>